Hello and welcome to the course Introduction to the Psychology of Language. I am Dr. Arik Verma from IIT Kanpur. This is the second week of the course and in this week we will start talking about development of language. In the last week as you would remember we talked about some of the introductory concepts in language, what is language, how does language evolve, we also talked about the relationship between language and thought and some of the other issues that were kind of uh, focused in establishing a very basic understanding of what language is. In this week uh, all of these lectures will basically be focused on understanding one problem, the problem of acquiring language. We will look at the language and we look at some of the basic skills that children uh, require to acquire language. We will look at some of the characteristics that are very important in order to understand how language really functions. We will also look at different ways in which uh, you know young children, young infants uh, kind of surmount some of these challenges in order to learn language uh, from the day they are born till they can actually uh, speak fluently in their native language. Okay. So, let us move on and uh, let us uh, you know begin today's lecture with asking this question. Do you think children talk and if you think that they talk, how are they able to do so? What is it that they talk about? Is whatever they do equivalent to language or is it something else? Let us look at some of the basic output of what you know children uh, do uh, as far as language is concerned. Children make vegetative sounds since birth, you know, they, they make all kinds of sound, ah, boo, ba, or whatever, all those kind of sounds, they cry, they laugh, they also make sucking sounds. They are creating some kind of uh, output as far as uh, sound is concerned as soon as they are born and that kind of continues uh, further. By the time they are around 16 weeks, they start uh, making cooing and babbling sounds, you know, cooing and if you, if you observe a baby, uh, they will be creating a lot of uh, basic sounds which probably would not carry a lot of meaning, but they use those sounds in order to express themselves, express sometimes the emotional state whether they are very, uh, you know, uh, uh, happy or they are, uh, you know, very cranky or they are about to cry or they are hungry, so on and so forth. So, there is some kind of output there, but is that output equivalent to communication? Remember, we had a basic discussion about how animal communication functions and we kind of uh, said at that point in time that whatever sounds these animals are making are still sometimes uh, sufficient for having meaningful communication. Are these sounds that children make sufficient for communication? So, that is something that we have to worry about. Okay. Also, children engage in what is referred to as vocal play between 16 weeks and 6 months of their age, wherein they kind of use these sounds for, uh, you know, all sorts of purposes, for calling you, for, uh, you know, uh, uh, asking to be lifted up or for asking for food, etc. Okay. Uh, after 6 months, uh, there is a time when children start making single word utterances, you know, between uh, 10 to 18 months, most children are kind of, you know, uh, creating a single word utterances, they say their first words and moving on from there in another 6 months, they can actually come up with 2 or more words utterances. They start with what is properly known as telegraphic speech, which say for example, could have a few words which will be able to communicate something which will express some sort of a meaning, but will not necessarily have a lot of syntactical arrangement to it. Okay. So, this is referred to as telegraphic speech and children express this telegraphic speech from around 2 years of age and further. After that, children finally start speaking in full sentences which are more or less syntactically correct as well. So, this is just say for example, a glossary view at what kind of uh, you know uh, sound output, what kind of speech output so to speak, children are able to achieve at this very early age. So, what do we say? Uh, how do we answer this question as to whether children talk? We are not very sure. Maybe uh, because some of their vocalizations, you know, are uh, able to express some kind of intentions and they are able to, uh, you know, get some kinds of jobs done, maybe they communicate. Let us uh, look at this a little bit more closely. Uh, so, uh, one of the ways of looking at this more closely is, uh, you know, looking at some of the theories that uh, exist about language acquisition. There are two positions about this. Uh, one of them is uh, the nativist position and the other is called the behaviorist position. So, remember these names and uh, let us just try and uh, look at what these positions say. So, uh, the behaviorist position 
uh, that is the th position also taken by the learning theorists, behaviorists or rationalists as some people call them. Uh, they basically say that children do not know any language at birth, nothing uh, of the vocalization that children are making uh, can actually be classified as human language. And so you have to believe that children are born as blank slaves. They have no idea of language or any of the linguistic skills at the time of birth. However, they say the children are fast learners, they pick up information very quickly. From the time they are born and from the time they are exposed to human language by a way of interacting with their mothers, with their other parents, with their immediate caregivers and people around them, by the time they are born, they start picking up aspects of human language and they are very good at picking this up. They are very fast at grasping this knowledge and that is what basically amounts to their success in being able to speak fluently in a little less than you know uh, around two two and a half years of age. So uh, in some sense you could say that the behavior stance is telling us that babies are dumb you know they don't know anything and it is a funny way of saying also this is how uh, Traxler puts it in his book is that babies are dumb they don't know anything about language if you are just talking about language. But uh, it has been known and it has been documented in other fields of study, uh, especially within psychology, uh, that children are not entirely dumb. They have some of those uh, capabilities with respect to other mental functions that are there from birth, that they probably have from the first day on the planet. So, examples could be simple, they have a sense of, uh, if you hide some objects, they will probably look for them. Uh, they have uh, a sense of appreciating the physical properties of objects, they can recognize particular objects. Uh, they also have a sense of quantity, they can probably distinguish between something that is very few in quantity versus something that is too much in quantity. So, some of these things they do have, okay, but uh, whether they do have a lot with respect to language is something that we have to see. Okay, so the native stance begins with saying that babies are smart, you know, they are born with some basic innate skills, they are born with some basic innate knowledge and that this knowledge might be helpful uh, for them in acquiring language. Okay, so these are the two stances, let us kind of move further and look at this in, in a bit more detail. Now, uh, the nativist approach at language ability is kind of looking at it as that arrives out of adaptation and you know, natural selection as uh, something that the species has learned over millions and millions of years. It might all seem to be a bit of a waste if nothing is kind of innate sense transferred to the coming generations. Okay. So, that is probably some of the you know very basic feeling behind the native stance as far as acquisition of language is concerned. Now, the nativists uh, propose that babies have what are called innate learning mechanisms that allow them to pick up linguistic skills. Okay? So, Steven Pinker, I remember, also Traxler uh, cites him, uh, you know, uh, proposes what is referred to as a language you know, a special, uh, you know, language learning device or Chomsky also talks about language uh, acquisition device that there is some innate ability to acquire language that is manifested in the children. So, uh, you know, they are born with these basic skills which will allow them to pick up language very quickly and very fast uh, and, uh, you know, and, and very easily over the time that they spend on earth, okay. So, uh, some of the examples of uh, you know uh, some of these kind of abilities could be say for example that they uh, that it has been reported that children pay attention to specific aspects of the environment and they organize their perceptual input to maximize their understanding of language. Suppose say for example, if you observe uh, you know uh, very young infants, if you observe children, what they do more uh, most intently is they listen up. You know, they are uh, spending time, they are listening to whatever is being said or spoken around them. They are kind of, you know, they are looking at you, uh, they are listening to what you are speaking, they are looking at your eyes and where your eyes are, there is a child in front of me you know, and the child is looking at me and I am, uh, you know, lifting this thing up and I am saying pen. So, you will see that the child is attending to this uh, completely, okay. If I do this consistently and a fair amount of times, uh, what the child will eventually be able to tell me is if I ask him that if this, if I ask him or her at the, uh, that you know where is the pen, the child will probably point towards this or at least move their head towards it. Okay, so that could tell us that okay, children are kind of you know uh, learning something about language by way of paying attention. 
to their environment you know they are paying attention not only to my uh, you know uh, eyes and my expressions and my voice and they are also looking at what I am holding when I am saying pen okay. So, some of these abilities could in some sense it has been said uh, help children in picking up bits and pieces of the linguistic skills that they eventually master by the time they are 2, 2 and a half, 3 years of age. Now, uh, let us survey some of these uh, abilities that have been documented. Research has shown that newborn infants can tell the difference between recordings of speaking their native language and the same person speaking a different language. So, if you uh, make children listen to recordings of a, a known person, a mother or a parent or a sibling or anybody else uh, who is speaking their own language. Their own language is the language they are born into, the language that the mother and the father speak. Uh, more often than not this uh, becomes uh, you know um, uh, the language of the mother because the mother is the one who interacts with the child most. However, it is just mostly st statistical in nature. Uh, when I say uh, their own language, I am probably talking about the language that have that they have had the most exposure to. Okay? So, that uh, needs to be remembered. Now, coming back to this example, newborn infants can tell the difference between speakers speaking their own language versus the same speaker speaking a different language. So, this is at least a point where children have now started to, uh, you know, uh, distinguish uh, between uh, their own language versus another language and this is I am talking about newborn infants, uh, infants as young as you know 24 hours or 48 hours. Talking about 48 hour old, uh, 2 days old children of French speaking parents uh, have been shown to detect whether a bilingual female was speaking French or Russian and they have also uh, kind of expressed their preference to listen to French over Russian by the same speaker. So, this was something uh, which was shown by Meller and colleagues in 1988 and it kind of tells us that yes, children are attending to language. They are paying very, uh, uh, very detailed attention to what language is being uh, said and so much so that they can distinguish between the same person speaking French and speaking Russian. Okay. What should this tell us? Okay. Should this tell us that say for example, the French speaking children are born with uh, genes that allow them to French, it could be something else. Another uh, option could be say for example, uh, if you are a behaviorist, if you are a rationalist, you might say that no, 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 uh, they were not born with anything to do with French. However, as soon as they were born, they were exposed to French, you know, the first hours of birth, they are still exposed to French because their parents probably are speaking French around them and the other uh, agents in the environment are speaking French around them. So, what the children have done is that they have acquired that much of French very quickly. They have kind of you know picked up on that much of French very quickly and it is on the basis of that acquisition in 24 to 48 hours after birth that they can now distinguish French from Russian. Okay? So, these are the two hypotheses. Uh, I do not know for uh, you would think of them you might take a step back uh, you know pause the lecture for a bit and think of which of the two is more plausible. Okay? Once you have done that and you come back, I could tell you that none of the two seem very plausible to me. Okay? Uh, super fast learning within 24 hours by you know uh, uh, or within 40 hours let us say 48 hours let us say maybe 72 hours even. Uh, the first few hours uh, the baby mostly is sleeping. Okay, so, uh, you know the first few hours uh, after birth, uh, if uh, you know the days of 24 hours, you can uh, safely assume that the child probably would be sleeping anywhere between 18 to 22 hours. Uh, how is the child going to pick up any language at that point in time? So, I am not really very convinced with the super fast learning idea, English French from English. Uh, does the French gene seem more plausible? But suppose for example, uh, for, you know uh, a child uh, born to French speaking parents. Uh, was adopted by a non French speaking family, uh, will the child be only able to speak French or will the child be able to learn the uh, you know language of the adoptive parents. It has been seen that children are very quick at learning uh, any language that they are. So, then the French, French speaking gene example also does not really seem to be very correct to me. So, what is the solution? Where do we go from here? There is third possibility that people have uh, you know uh, pointed out and that possibility is that of prenatal learning. What is prenatal learning? Prenatal learning is learning that has started to happen even before the child is born inside the mother's womb. So, children it seems 
are picking up some skills or are picking up some, some information even before they are born, even while they are still in their mother's bellies. Okay. So, let us look at what is there any evidence for prenatal learning, how do we say that any prenatal learning really happens. So, it has been known uh, for some time that the fetus's auditory system starts functioning and is capable of handling auditory input by the time they are around you know uh, uh, 6 months in the mother's belly. So, by the time the third trimester arrives. Okay. So, by the third trimester uh, uh, children's ears, uh, fetus's ears are able to process auditory input and they are also able to respond to auditory input. Okay. Uh, we have quite a few myths around this and uh, there are a lot of stories that go around at, about whether children can learn some information while they are in the mother's womb. Uh, you might know of that, we can discuss that in a different uh, you know, section sometime. Now, these environmental sounds, what is it of the environmental sounds that kind of reaches the baby's uh, ears? Uh, you would know that uh, you know uh, children are in the mother's uh, womb um, uh, suspended in uh, the fetus, uh, they are suspended in this uh, you know sac and the sac is full, filled with what is referred to as the amniotic liquid. So, the amniotic fluid uh, basically probably is filtering out a lot of other things about the speech input, but what probably reaches the child is at least information about the pitch, frequency, the pauses and some of the more uh, cosmetic or uh, uh, supra segmental kind of features of speech. These features put together are referred to as prosodic features. Okay. So, these prosodic characteristics of speech, uh, you know, which are say for example, relative loudness, uh, the accent, the fundamental frequency, pitch, tempo, all of those kind of things are available to the fetus as early as the third trimester of pregnancy, uh, which might allow a degree of familiarization with the native language. Also, uh, this could kind of um, contribute to the mother's language already becoming native language because it is the mother's voice that the child is most closest to and that is the uh, voice that the child has most access to, so to speak. Now, uh, there are these three possibilities. How does one really test for that? How do we separate uh, whether it is the French speaking gene or how do we separate whether it is say, for example, you know, super fast post birth learning or whether it is even pre-birth learning or prenatal learning. Okay? There are ways in which we kind of you know, can do this. So, there are uh, you know when you work with, when you need to work with children in psychology especially, uh, we always work with uh, human participants with older uh, uh, people or older children or younger adults or uh, you know even older adults. It is easy because we can design uh, questionnaires and surveys and interviews and we can ask them to do it or uh, as is done is in experimental psychology, cognitive psychology from where I come, we create experiments. Uh, experiments are very simple, there are some visuals and there is some button press or some joystick pushing, some kind of response has to be taken and we kind of uh, you know uh, engage in this methodology with the younger uh, children and the older adults and so on. How do we do it with young children? How do we do it with children as young as 24 hours old or 48 hours old if we have to do it? So, there are obviously some uh, very in, uh, intelligent and genuine uh, uh, scientists that have been and they have devised methods to do this. So, one of the methods that we will hear a lot about in this chapter, high amplitude sucking procedure is one that taps into one of the most natural instincts of the born baby. What is the most natural instinct of the baby who is born? It is sucking. You know, children suck for food, they suck nutritively, they are uh, for the most uh, time, you know, looking for food and nutrition and they do it, uh, you know, uh, as soon as they are born. Nobody really teaches the child to suck, okay. So, that is one. It has also been, by the way, discovered that children also engage in what is referred to as non-nutritive sucking. When they are not having food, when they are not you know, hungry or anything, but they are still kind of doing the sucking response, they are still doing the sucking behavior in between feeding time. So, in, in some sense that could also be taken as an index uh, of whether they are interested in something, whether it is their state of mind so to speak, mothers are very good at judging this. So, they developed this procedure uh, in which newborn infants are connected to what is referred to as a pressure transducer. It is again, it is basically like a sucking device, a nipple may be. However, uh, you can measure the amount of pressure that the child is going to apply on this. Okay? You can measure uh, how many times the child is sucking on this. Okay? So, this pressure transducer is connected to the baby's mouth and uh, the frequency of sucking and the pressure that the child applies while sucking can both be measured. 
Okay. So, these are the two dependent variables basically and when you kind what uh, basically the pressure transducer gives is it gives you measurements in terms of amplitude and the amplitude is basically the indicator of how much pressure that the baby is applying while sucking at it. Okay. And that pressure uh, can also change when uh, so for example, when children are being uh, exposed to a new stimulus or a new appetitive stimulus so to speak, suppose the child is kind of you know just there and you put the pressure transducer and the child is sucking, if there is a new sound the child becomes very curious and starts you know sometimes looking at it, if you are talking about very young children they do not have control of the neck muscles, so they do not really, they are not in a position to look at it by turning their head, but they kind of show their interest by sucking very hard on the nipples. So, when they suck very hard at the nipples you get some kind of an amplitude uh, rising and then what happens is when the child kind of gets used to that sound that uh, you know amplitude goes back to what is referred to as the baseline levels. Okay. That is what is referred to as the habituation that the child is now habituated to this sound and the sound is not really very novel or interesting to the child anymore. Another way is once you again in uh, you know introduce the child to a novel stimulus then what happens is that the uh, sucking rate again goes up that is referred to as dishabituation. Now during the cycle of habituation and dishabituation it is very easy uh, in some sense or uh, you know to detect whether the child uh, can detect differences between two kind of stimuli example you can present the child with one kind of pattern uh, ba 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 and suddenly you do the you know, if you are doing ba 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 for uh, a sufficiently long time, initially initial bars may have excited the child, so the sucking rate would have gone up. But then, if you keep doing just ba 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 ba, the sucking rate will come down and rest at the baseline level. And then you suddenly do da, and uh, you will see that uh, amplitude kind of rises, and that basically tells you that the child can now distinguish between ba and da. That is the crux of how this paradigm basically is used. So I'll talk about the HAS procedure many a times in this chapter and uh, if you do not really you know get it at that point you can come back to this and try and uh, understand what the HAS procedure actually means. Now the HAS paradigm has been used extensively to investigate the effects of prenatal exposure to speech sounds. So uh, you know if children are being exposed to certain sounds uh, you know uh, even before birth uh, there are ways to test that and uh, the HAS procedure is one that has helped people test that. Let us look at some examples. In one of the studies it happened that uh, pregnant mothers uh, recited a short story two times a day every day during the last six weeks of their pregnancies. Okay. So, these mothers would take up a particular story suppose for example, the cat in the hat or anything and they will read that story uh, again and again when the baby is in sort of a quiet quiescent state when the baby is not very really perturbed. So, the baby kind of also gets to listen to this and they do this uh, you know two times a day and they do this every day for six weeks. What happens then? After the babies are born uh, they were tested uh, using the HAS paradigm before the babies were 2.5 days old. So, roughly before the babies were like 60 hours old or so. Okay. All of the test babies they were tested for this same story. All of the test babies listened to the familiar story and the new story uh, read by the same person. So, the same person kind of read the same the one story that they were habituated with and the other story. Uh, they worked harder to listen to the familiar story and uh, they did not really uh, prefer listening so much to the new story. What does this finding tells us? It tells us that fetuses did actually pick up something while they were in their mother's womb in the last 6 months. They did pick up aspects of the story whether it is the tempo, whether it is the pitch, whether it is the relative loudness, accent, whatever prosthetic features they picked up, they did pick up something from that story. Obviously, they probably did not pick up a lot of meaning or what the story meant or something, but they at least picked up some of the cosmetic features of language that there are. So, what could have helped them? How did they really achieve that? So, there are as we said again there is there is this uh, answer of prosodic cues, uh, you know alternating patterns of soft and uh, loud sounds, patterns of high and low tones, pauses, uh, so forth would obviously have been available even in the mother's womb. Okay. Uh, as these patterns are consistent across speakers, uh, these are very easy for the babies to detect these familiar patterns and even when the story was read by somebody else. So, this was not only familiarity with their mother's voice. The story while being tested was read by a different person even, uh, even though mothers had decided the story and they would have gotten familiar with the story in the mother's voice, they could distinguish between this story and another story 
both of them being read by a third person okay so it's not familiarity with the mother's voice that is playing a part here you have to remember it is the patterns of that particular story also i mean there are consistencies across say for example if uh, i am reading twinkle twinkle little star versus somebody else is reading twinkle twinkle little star okay some of the patterns of the both the recitations will be similar unless we are doing it in a very different manner so maybe the children are picking up these patterns of those you know language snippets that they are being exposed to this is something which kind of uh, tells us that some kind of prenatal learning is happening okay and this prenatal learning is heavily based on the prosodic features of language which you could say are sort of now laying the foundation stone for whatever the children will learn further from here all right so uh, one could still argue uh, the learning theorists uh, they could still argue that learning happened shortly after the birth of the child you know you can still say that uh, even the story thing that the children probably would have picked up after they were born in 24 hours or so and so to speak so what they did was they wanted to solve this out so they said okay let's do another study and they did another study uh, and in this study basically mothers recited these short nursery rhymes as a single twinkle little star ba ba black sheep whatever some short nursery rhymes uh, they did this three times a day while their fetuses were in again a quiescent state for over a month it is again in, uh, uh, in while the fetuses are in the mother's womb then while the fetuses heart rate was being measured mothers listened to a recording of a different female reading either the same nursery rhyme or a new nursery rhyme again the babies are not born this is still in the fetus okay in the earlier study the babies were born we are talking about around 60 hours old children here we are talking about fetuses still in the mother's womb and they are being tested you know, with the same nursery rhyme versus different nursery rhyme so let us see what happens now there is this phenomena uh, called cardiac deceleration cardiac deceleration basically happens when the baby's heart rate settles down uh, or slows down in response to particular stimuli which kind of is indicative of the fact that the child is used to again in, in a sense habituated or unhabituated with that particular sound uh, in this test uh, while the children are still in the mother's fetus uh, fetuses showed greater cardiac deceleration for the more familiar rhyme as compared to the newer rhyme and these effects were larger for older fetuses versus newer fetuses so you'll see that there is a developmental progression happening here as well and this is happening pre birth so that super fast uh, you know uh, post birth learning thing kind of goes out of the window so with this set of results we can kind of safely assume that fetuses do pick up and retain prosodic information about language even before they are born and this could be some of the foundational features of acquisition of language as we will also see later okay so let's try and sum this part up a little bit it seems that there are two positions that argue about whether language is an innate ability or something that you know children pick up uh, once the auditory system starts processing input which is around the third trimester in the coming lectures we'll see how the two stances contrast as per the predictions are concerned about learning different aspects of language learning now uh, let us uh, move to a next part let us ask some other questions uh, about uh, you know language development so uh, we've talked about some of these three basic things but there is a lot of uh, there is a bit of a uh, theoretical idea that i also wanted to uh, discuss in this class uh, which is about what could be the driving forces of language acquisition or language development there have been some of the candidates that have been offered uh, one of the candidates is uh, referred to as uh, imitation so a lot of people would say that you know one of the simplest explanations of children's ex exquisite performance with language learning has to do with imitation children are merely imitating their adults and by way of imitation they are figuring out how adult language works that is how they are kind of moving while that may be true in part it has been proposed that it imitation cannot be the sole driving force for learning of language especially as far as grammatical rules are concerned we are not always checking what grammatical rules children are following or what kind of language that uh, so i mean they are speaking that uh, children make a lot of mistakes that adults do not so if it were if their language output were basically entirely based on just imitation it's that slightly hard to explain the kind of errors they make you know they make a lot of that adults do not and that cannot happen that cannot be explained through uh, you know uh, just by imitation of adult speech so that is one thing 
The other candidate is referred to as conditioning. If you have done some elementary psychology or if you kind of looked at some of the other courses that I have taught, you would know that conditioning is one of the basic mechanisms you know as to how learning happens. You know, B. F. Skinner, John Watson, they were some of the, they were the pioneers of learning uh, theories and Skinner believed uh, in, in that sense that l language uh, is also acquired in much the same way that adults acquire most skills. And they believed at that point in time that most uh, learning or acquisition of skills happens through what is referred to as conditioning. Conditioning is merely just associating stimuli. Okay. Say for example, uh, you know the, the famous example is Pavlov's uh, example wherein there was this dog, and the dog was uh, fed uh, regularly but at some point in time you know the person who used to uh, provide uh, food, uh, you know somehow he used to ring, ring a bell, you know he used to open the door, uh, come into the shed. Uh, but that sound of the bell uh, got associated with the timing of the food and eventually it was seen that the uh, uh, dog started salivating to not only the food which always used to happen, but the dog also started salivating to the uh, you know sound of the bell. This connection being made between the bell and the food and then uh, the response that you get uh, to food is also now uh, you know getting uh, to the bell is referred to as conditioning. Coming back. Uh, Skinner, uh, he believed that learning happens in much the same way and learning of language, acquisition of language also happens in much the same way. He wrote a book called Verbal Behavior wherein he kind of you know uh, elaborates upon these theories. However, people have raised problems with that. Okay. Uh, there are uh, say for example, there are people like Noam Chomsky who is kind of uh, you know uh, pointed specific problems with that, we will kind of go to that. But let us look at some of the problems that have been raised. One of the first things uh, is that learning sometimes also requires a lot of feedback and adults do not usually give explicit feedback to children for their grammatical output. So we do not really all the time keep correcting children. We do not really all the time tell them okay this construction that you are making is grammatically correct, this construction that you are making is grammatically incorrect, you should correct this to uh, move to a grammatically more correct version. We are not doing that with our children all the time. How is it then? that from the time that they start speaking, uh, you know, 18 months, uh, 2 years to a little bit more than 2.5 to 3 years, they start from, uh, you know, making a lot of grammatical errors to really reaching a point where they are speaking flawless native language, you know, Hindi, English, Bengali, Tamil, whatever that might be, okay. So let us look at some of the examples, you know, let us look at whether children actually listen to uh, the feedback. So you will see some of the snippets that I have borrowed from Trevor Harley's book. Uh, the psychology of language, look at this conversation. So, in one of the conversations, child says doggy pointing at a horse and the mother kind of corrects this. He says, no, it is that is not a dog, that is a horse, that is a horsey, okay. In a different uh, thing, the adult is trying to teach the child to speak turtle. So, the child, adult says tur, the child says tur, and the adult says still, and the child says still, and basically uh, adult says say turtle and then the child kind of fails to combine this, okay. Similarly, uh, the child says mama is not a boy, he a girl and the adult says that is right. You see uh, syntactically that is not right but meaning wise that is correct. Okay. So in some sense you can say that the adults or the parents are mostly about correcting whether the statement that the child is making is factually correct or incorrect. They are not really very worried about the syntax of what the child is saying. That is one. Let us move on to a different example where parents are actually trying to do that. So uh, in this conversation the child says, uh, my teacher holded the rabbits and we patted them. And the adult asks, yeah, did you say uh, the teacher held the baby rabbits? Child says, yes. Uh, the adult said, what did you say? Repeat again. The child says, she holded the rabbits and we patted them. The adult again uh, kind of tries to remind, did you say she held them tightly? No, uh, the child says, no, she holded them uh, loosely. So you see the feedback on syntax is not uh, clearly working. Okay. Uh, also let us say another example, adult says he is going out, uh, child says he go out, Adam, uh, adult says Adam say what I say, where can I put them? Uh, the child kind of repeats where I can put them. So you see exact repetition is also not happening. Both of these examples you will see adults are trying to give some feedback by the way of syntactical grammatical construction but that is also not really rubbing off as well as it probably should, okay. So even if as adults we were about grammatical constructions to our children, they are not really listening in, in that sense, they are not really being able to follow or even repeat because they probably have not mastered those rules of grammar themselves. 
until eventually they do it by themselves, they will not be able to follow these instructions anyways. So, this is interesting. This probably tells us that they are probably the you know the learning thing is not really fitting in well here. You know, so it is clear from these examples that while parents most often do not provide feedback about children's syntactic correctedness, when they do, it might or might not have an impact on the child's language. That is one. It has also been shown that different uh, cultures they respond differently to syntactically incorrect utterances. So, again, that is not something that happens universally. Okay, some cultures might uh, value syntactic correctness a lot, some cultures might not. Still, ch uh, children from both of these cultures end up learning language equally well. So, that also is, is something. Further, it has been said that such feedback is probably too infrequent to be effective. Although some would feel that occasionally if you do this, uh, it might kind of facilitate the child's overall language development. Okay? So, both of these things are there. The latter argument, you know, that uh, you know, occasionally contrasting our own language output with the children's output might be useful. So, that kind of uh, is, is still uh, can be supported by uh, the fact uh, that children are more prone to repeating adults expansions of their utterances than other utterances. Suppose for example, as an adult you are uh, describing a sentence to the child. Okay. The child is more likely to repeat that and in that doing so might be able to pick up some of the rules of the language there. So, that is just, just one uh, you know uh, aspect of that. However, it is an important discussion to have you know whether children receive sufficient negative feedbacks uh, on their grammatical errors without which it could be difficult to explain how children move from uh, making so many grammatical errors to not making any errors within a very short span of time. Let us move further. Uh, another problem by the way to the learning approach to language acquisition, the one advocated by Skinner and others is that the pattern of acquisition of uh, irregular past tense verbs, it basically cannot be accounted for just by learning. Say for example, you see children all the time use uh, irregular past tense incorrectly. Say for example, they would sometimes say gived instead of uh, gave, they would say drinked instead of drank, you know these kind of errors children make very commonly. Now, an explanation for this pattern is that probably what the children are doing is they are first mastering specific instances, they will first master specific past tense forms of you know specific of these specific verbs and then basically what they will do is eventually when they have so many of these, they will deduce a general rule. You know, the general rule could be that if you add ed to a verb form, you can get a past tense of that. So, for example, if you add ed to play, you make played. Okay. So, that is that is probably something that is happening. Now, it is only later that the children will uh, be able to master the exceptions to this rule that drink uh, plus ed does not really make the correct uh, past tense form of drink because the correct past tense form of drink is drank similarly for thought or similarly for gave and which is gave. Okay. This pattern is referred to as the U shaped development. Performance starts off at a good level because they are mastering specific instances, then kind of goes down uh, because they are kind of coming across so many of these exceptions and then while they have mas started mastering these exceptions, the performance again comes up. This is the U shaped development for uh, you know acquisition of uh, irregular past tense verb forms. Okay. So, thirdly there are also say for example, words that children uh, you know uh, understand even before they are produced. Say for example, uh, you know they understand the meaning of no or the meaning of yes for example, even before they can actually produce them. Okay. So, some learning is, is happening before even they are doing something. You know. So, again all three of these points you know, the irregular past tense form, the third the new uh, words form and the third thing about feedback all of them together if you see kind of uh, you know uh, tells us. Uh, that maybe children are not really learning language through uh, you know uh, uh, conditioning or other kind of learning procedures that have been uh, you know specified. One of the last things we could talk about in this lecture again we are kind of theoretically discussing uh, you know, the possible drivers of language development is poverty of stimulus. Chomsky uh, argued that children could not learn the rules of grammar by environmental exposure alone because he believed that the environmental exposure is at the best inadequate. It does not carry enough information for the child to be able to deduce a lot of language out of it. Okay. He believed that children are exposed to what is referred to as degenerated input, you know that the speech that children hear is full of slips of tongue, it is full of false starts, hesitations uh, and also sounds are all jumbled up together, it is a continuous uh, stream of speech. Uh, all of this kind of make it very difficult for the child to master anything out of the speech you know, that the child is exposed to. 
Also, uh, he says that there is not enough information in the language that the children are exposed. There are not enough examples of grammatically incorrect things being pointed as grammatically incorrect things so that the child can deduce a rule out of it. Both of these things are there. Okay. So, this is the idea of poverty of stimulus that there is not enough information uh, in this uh, whole thing uh, for children to be actually you know picking up a lot of a lot out of it. Okay. Let us move uh, to the final uh, segment of today's talk which is child directed speech. One of the major uh, candidates which have been suspected to be you know driving language development uh, especially in very very young infants the just born still the slightly older infants is this uh, concept of child directed or infant directed speech. If you have noticed uh, all of us especially parents and then even people around uh, these young kids we speak to them in a very different way as compared to when we speak to you know people of our same age you know we speak to them uh, uh, in, in a way that is uh, usually referred to as baby talk but has certain characteristics you know we, it has exaggerated prosody it has so many pauses it has high pitch it has this sing song tone about it so that prosodic features are exaggerated uh, phonologically very simple words are used ba ba da da ga ga those kind of things uh, you know shorter sentences are used simpler vocabulary is used uh, say for example also that you know the differences between successive words uh, is very highlighted so the child can pick up what words are being used you know all of this put together kind of in some sense makes it very easy for the child to appreciate what language is being spoken what is the content of whatever is being spoken so all of that is here now other features will include also that we when we talk to uh, children about the world we start uh, we you know, tend to use very simple nouns very basic level nouns we will not talk to a child and say that this is a dog and the dog is a mammal we will not really say we will just talk about it as a dog it is basically that at that level you know at the level that is most easy to understand okay. Uh, also, it has been pointed out that child directed speech or infant directed speech is directed towards the child. We are just talking when you are talking to the child, we are just talking to the child alone you know and we are kind of highlighting it in such a way that the speech stands out uh, in face of all the background noise that maybe the child knows exactly what you are speaking and the child is as I said earlier paying attention to what you are speaking. Okay. It is easy, we are making it easy for the child to pick up word boundaries to uh, you know uh, make a sense of what I am say, saying pen. So, the child will know that I am looking at this object and putting at this as a pen. Please pick up this pen, something like that. Okay. I am not very good at doing this though. So, uh, it has been said that IDS, CDS, whatever you call it is used both by mothers and fathers and it has also been shown that children kind of prefer to listen to the IDS or CDS, infant directed or child directed speech rather than to normal speech. So, they are showing some preference for this as well. Okay. It has been also proposed in that sense that these uh, ways of speaking the, uh, the facilitate language learning by possibly aiding the children to appreciate the phonology, morphology and the syntax of a language in a much more simplified manner. It is almost like we are giving them a lot of practice in what is going to come next. Remember it is not all the time that we talk to children like this. But say for example, whenever we talk to the children more often than not we are kind of using this language which is in, in a sense we are giving them this practice with adult language. Okay. So, this is all for today. Uh, I was uh, trying to give you a basic initiation into what are the topics, what are the problems in acquiring language. And uh, in the coming lectures, we will kind of take up this uh, uh, you know topic a little bit further looking at what are the basic challenges that the children need to uh, you know surmount in order to uh, say for example, uh, you know acquire language flawlessly in what is a very short period of time. Thank you.